So the other day I'm watching a YouTube video from Steve Morris and he's telling people you don't have to change your ignition timing when you add boost. And I was like, that doesn't sound right to me. So I call him up, Steve, what are you talking about? You can't tell people that. Steve of course goes, ah, don't get your panties in a wad. That's not what I said. I said, you shouldn't have to change the timing if your fuel is tolerant. So in this video, we're gonna use these $5,000 combustion sensors that go in the engine to measure the cylinder pressure and find out if Steve was right or wrong. All right, real quick. Let's start out with how we're gonna use these sensors. Now, these are tiny little, very sophisticated pressure transducers. These things are super expensive, about $5,000 each. That's per cylinder. So on a V8 engine, you're gonna spend a ton of money to do this, but it's worth it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sacrifice our cylinder heads by drilling a hole through the head right here where it comes out in the combustion chamber. Then we're gonna thread in these little sensors. And what these do is they measure the combustion pressure and then we use sensors and amplifiers and sophisticated data acquisition to take samples from the engine at about 200,000 samples per second. Putting that into perspective, at 10,000 RPM, that gives us about one third of a degree of resolution. So let's go look at our data acquisition software and I'll show you how we can interpret what's happening in the engine. All right, let's take a minute and look at some of this data that we get after we collect it with these sensors. So I'm gonna lay it out here in my software like we would typically imagine people see cylinder pressure. So I've got RPM up here, down here as we sweep through, you can see the cylinder pressure. This is in bar. So, you know, 60, 70 bar times say 15 PSI gives you an example of what we're talking about. But the problem is it's not that useful in this format. If we look over here to the right side, we can see as I scroll through, this is cylinder volume here at the bottom and then pressure here. But again, not all that, not all that useful. So we're gonna come back to that in just a second. But up here, what we've got, if I just go over here to log P log V. I'm looking at the same data, but now this is cylinder volume and pressure going here, but it's scaled logarithmically. It just means compared to itself to give us an expanded view. But if you start over here at the left, we're talking about top dead center. So we go down on the intake stroke to bottom dead center. Then we go back up. Now this is the part that's interesting. This is our compression stroke here. And then we get the ignition and we have the power stroke coming down and then we open the exhaust valve, we pump it all back out on the exhaust stroke, boom, we're back to top dead center. That's our four stroke cycle. But one of the things that we can do is we can kind of do some fun and fancy math here. If we know what the cylinder pressure and volume is at any one given location, we can predict what it should be at another location using the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Pressure and volume is the mass and the real gas constant and the temperature. So somewhere down here, if we know what our cylinder pressure is near the bottom, we can draw this blue line, which is a slope that represents how much the pressure and temperatures should increase. Now, at some point, the yellow line here that we're measuring in pressure, it gets above our predicted line, and that's because we had combustion. So it follows this slope perfectly until the combustion starts. Then we get all that heat and expansion happening, and at some point, this red line, it does the same thing. It predicts the amount of pressure we would have as the gases are expanding and our volume is increasing. So our slope of the measured line is very close to that actual line. So we can actually then calculate and measure how long the combustion process takes. We can measure things like maximum cylinder pressure, the location of the cylinder pressure, how long it took to do the combustion process, even things like how much power and torque we make in the cylinder. So what's interesting here, and so if I go up and look at some of this data, I've got it, I've got it uh, parsed out here where it says uh, a crank RPM is 6,059 RPM. At that point, our maximum cylinder pressure is 71.2 bar. The combustion duration for that one cycle took 44.3 degrees. But the problem with doing it in degrees is that value tends to go up with RPM. You can see by the time I'm up here at 8,000 RPM, now it's like 51 degrees. And so I've converted that into time in milliseconds by converting the engine speed into how many degrees you're doing per second and then how many degrees we're covering. It gives us a time value. But you can see here for this engine, it's about 1.1 or so milliseconds from the beginning all the way to the end. And you can see the power there too. But it's the ability to plot the cylinder pressure against the cylinder volume that gives us an idea of what's actually happening there. 
All right, so here's the deal. Now that you can see how we collect the data and how we lay the data out, hopefully you can kind of see why I was concerned because I've got this data from a lot of different shapes and sizes and styles of engines. So I just had to pick up the phone and call them and go, hey, look, I can't say that I totally agree with everything that you were saying because my experience in life has been different than your experience. And that's totally fine. But let's talk about why, because I have had a couple of engines, most recently a Ford 7.3 liter Godzilla that I was tuning, do the same thing. So all of a sudden now I've got a couple of engines that did this and a bunch of other ones that didn't behave that way. And so he and I talked a lot about it. And when it came to the topic of combustion duration or combustion time, that's when I really started to dig into the data. So when we talk about combustion duration, it's like literally how long it takes from the moment you spark the spark plug until you've used up all the mixture in the combustion chamber. Now, this is where Steve and I disagreed a little bit, so that's why I wanted to talk to him, because when I think about how long it takes the cylinder to burn, one of the things that he said that I thought was very accurate was when the piston gets to top dead center, the volume's always the same. So when you put more air and fuel in there, he said, well, what happens? Well, here's what happens. If I was driving down a highway, let's say I'm driving between two big fields. Now, on the left side of my car, there's a field that's been totally untouched. So there's brush, dried grass, trees, all kinds of combustible materials in there. The one on the other side of the road, it's been graded and leveled. And there's some, you know, some weeds and some bushes here and there, but, but not a lot, right? So if that was my combustion chamber and my piston up here was all the way at the top, the more air and fuel molecules you pack into that same volume, the more closely those air and fuel molecules are packed together. So if I throw my cigarette out the window of my car and it lands in that field over there that has all the dried brush and grass, whoosh, it's gonna burn really quickly. If it lands on the other side in the field that has very little combustible material, or in our case, air and fuel mixture, you know, pushed up into that combustion chamber, then what happens is because the volume is the same, the distance or the proximity from any given air and fuel molecule are spread farther apart. So guess what? It takes longer for that combustion process to happen. And therefore, you have to start your ignition event earlier. That's what we would call advancing the timing. This is a very easy trend to see when you're mapping an EFI system where you'll notice that for any given fixed RPM, the lower you go in cylinder pressure, the more ignition advance is required. So the numbers in the table get bigger for more advance with less engine load. And as the engine load starts going up and we're filling that combustion chamber and packing more air and fuel in there, you light a match and throw it in there, boof, it burns quickly. So you reduce the ignition timing or retard the ignition timing as that cylinder pressure goes up. So generally speaking, adding boost has that same effect but not always because there's a number of other factors that affect us, not the least of which is bore size. You got a really big bore, it's gonna take longer to burn. But at the end of the day, it also has to do with combustion chamber size, which is a function of bigger and smaller, and shape. Steve did some great drawings in his video about combustion chamber between a wedge and a hemi. But the one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is the relationship between the surface area of a combustion chamber and its volume. So we call this surface area to volume ratio. And what we're talking about here is if you were to measure all this area in here for a given volume, there's a few different ways you could get to the same volume. Imagine like a, a straw, like a big, long, tall column doesn't have a lot of surface area for that volume, but if you spread that thing out, you'd have a huge puddle of, you know, air, fuel, whatever you want to call it, but a lot of surface area. Well, in a combustion chamber, the more surface area you have, the more you have of a conducting material that's basically trying to steal all that heat we've been making and get it into the aluminum of the cylinder head and into the water jacket and all that kind of stuff. So a hemi typically suffers in combustion efficiency compared to a wedge because while the hemis have great airflow capability, they steal a lot of the heat you're making from all that surface area. And so as proof, most of the time you see hemis like the old 426 hemis, a lot of the Gen 3 hemis, they got two spark plugs. They got two spark plugs because it takes so stinking long to burn the mixture in the combustion chamber that you'd have to have a silly amount of overly advanced timing that you don't want. Okay, real quick, here's a couple of examples. Here's a Hemi with two plugs, and I'll show you one without two plugs, but what we can see here is this Hemi's going across, and it's got really between about, oh, 1.1, and then down as low as about 0.6 or so, maybe 0.7 milliseconds to complete its combustion time. We compare that to a, a big mountain motor pro stock engine that's also a Hemi, and but only has one spark plug with a big bore. And look at our combustion time down here. It's like 
1.4, as, as high as 1.5, even 1.6 milliseconds. So ultimately what you can see is because of all those factors and only having one spark plug, it's going to take a lot longer to do that. So, you know, the longer that takes to complete that combustion process, the more timing re it is going to be required, the more advanced this engine is going to need. Think about this. The larger amount of number my timing is, the more advanced you have to make it for the engine to run well, the less efficient your combustion process was. If I could have it burn super fast and not have to light my spark plug at any point before top dead center, I would have less pressure building up as my piston's rising, trying to fight me, and I would have less time before top dead center when I'm doing compression rather than expansion, where I'm losing my heat to the combustion process. So I never want more timing. I just want the right amount of timing, and that's based on how much time it takes to burn the mixture. So things like fuel volatility. When we think about how volatile a fuel is, remember, your fuel's only going to burn if it's in vaporized form. The volatility has a lot to do with how quickly it will change from a liquid to a vapor. Think about when you drive your car. You go up to the gas station and you got those gas pumps where it's got the green handle for diesel and the black handle for gas, right? If you go over there and look, most of the time that green handle is disgusting. It's still greasy and oily. It's got diesel all over it. There's diesel on the ground that's been there for three days because it didn't evaporate. If you go to the black handle for the gasoline pumps, it has really high volatility. It, it, it evaporates really easily. So if I spill some and I go get a paper towel, by the time I come back, it's already gone. That diesel sits there for two or three days because it has much lower volatility, which means it requires a much higher temperature to make it ignite, right? So the type of fuel you have and its volatility, Steve talked a lot about octane in his video, and that's great. Octane is a measurement of a fuel's resistance to detonation, but it doesn't have anything to do with a fuel's volatility. Volatility affects your flame propagation speed. Octane really doesn't. So it's how long we need to burn the mixture, not whether or not it can resist detonation, right? So fuel volatility, surface area to volume ratio, combustion chamber shape and size, all these things have an effect. How many spark plugs do you have? What about EGR? You remember those old EGR valves we had? EGR stood for exhaust gas recirculation. So if you're sticking a bunch of old used up exhaust back in the combustion chamber, it doesn't burn. So it has the same effect of moving those air and fuel molecules farther apart as it's diluting and mixing in there. So it tends to slow the process down. So when you have EGR present, you typically have to advance and start your ignition event earlier. Well, when you have boost, that ain't free. Getting a bunch more cylinder pressure through packing it in on the intake side usually comes at the expense of harder to get it out the exhaust. Now, whether you have a, a supercharged, like a procharged engine, or you've got a Whipple, or even a turbocharger, that's gonna come, that, that boost that you got, that we're so happy to have, came at the expense of having more pressure in the exhaust pipe. And so, if you get really high exhaust back pressure, it effectively doesn't allow the burned exhaust gases to leave the engine as well as they could otherwise. And so you end up with a natural EGR effect. So it's really hard for me to tell you that all engines will always want the same amount of timing with boost that they have with NA. The reality is some engines are going to want that, but other engines are not going to want that. So Let's take a minute and talk about what that looks like when we look at cylinder pressure. Now, what I did, I went and I collected data from a bunch of different engines and measured the amount of time that it took, and I wanna share that with you now. All right, so this is a little bit of data I'm gonna share with you from an LS engine. So this is a project we worked on with the Engine Performance Expo, my buddy Lake Speed Jr. Um, this is a pretty common, you know, uh, combination. It was 393 cubic inches, one of those like mid-deck LSX blocks, four inch crank, uh, crankshaft stroke. Uh, I don't know, I think it was 4055 or 4065 bore, something like that, but um, a really common, combination. And so this is a representation of the same cylinder head we used. You can see actually the little hole where it came through there and so that we could measure it. So we started out by just mapping the engine and using the software to tell us uh, how to get the ignition timing correct. And so that's not necessarily got anything to do with the actual combustion time or duration, just a matter of putting the cylinder pressures uh, that we can generate in the right spot. But once we did that, then we can go in here and measure. And you can see this is basically just a dyno pole. So you're holding here at 3,200 and the thing ramps up to peak. I think that run here, you go 7,700 or whatever. But what I've done here is I've plotted the combustion duration in degrees and in time. So as I sweep through here, we can see from the beginning of the run, it initially starts out and then it kind of comes down and sort of levels out in time here. 
at somewhere around 1.1 to 1.2 milliseconds. There we are, 7,500, we're at 1.1, 1.3, 1.9, right in there. So what we did then is after we got the engine tuned up really well, we went ahead and bolted on a pro charger, intercooler, and all the things we needed to make boost. And as I said before, we started out with like, well, we better take a bunch of timing out. And what got my attention on this deal was we started tuning and you know we did a couple of dyno pulls and it was very obvious right away that we didn't have the cylinder pressure in the correct location in other words when we added the boost we retarded the timing but the software was telling us that's not really the right thing to do so we sort of reluctantly and cautiously began to add more timing and um, at the time we were again we weren't really looking at the time for duration combustion duration we were just looking at where it was happening which is another um, data set altogether but once we got all done, we realized that, wow, if we really believe the software, then it took the same amount of ignition timing. And we had, I think, 22 and a half PSI boost. You know, we went from making 650 horsepower to like 1240 or something, and it took the same amount of advance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you here kind of the final tune up as we zoom in. You can see I got it laid out the same way. So, um, you know, we even went higher in RPM, you know, but the reality is if you look at this combustion time, this is 22 and a half pounds of boost after tuning the thing up. It made, I think, 1240 horsepower or something, pro charged uh, with an air to air intercooler. But look at my combustion times here. They're nearly identical in time. The length of time from when the spark plug fired to when we completed the combustion process and now we can start pushing down the, the cylinder, they're about the same. So no wonder it ended up taking the same amount of advance for the boosted combination on the same engine as we ran naturally aspirated. They don't always do that. Not all engines end up that way, but I think it has a lot to do with all those factors we talked about, you know, uh, combustion chamber shape and size, bore and, and, and size and stroke ratio, and even things like how much back pressure we're getting from using the naturally aspirated headers, but putting boost in there, those headers are getting plugged up. You're getting a lot more leftover exhaust gas. That exhaust gas tends to slow down the combustion process when you would think, well, naturally I put way more air and fuel in there, should burn faster. But in this case, it clearly did not. So the two combinations of LS uh, engines with NA and boost in this one application didn't require any change in timing. And that was really surprising but again, I've got lots of data from other engines that did not exhibit this behavior. And so that's what prompted the whole point of the conversation with Steve in this video. All right, now let's take a look at an example that doesn't follow this trend of same timing NA versus boost. Um, this is when Shane Tecklenburg and I were tuning with Rod Chagfree on the Sorceress ProMod engine. That's basically a 5.3.4 space, big block Chevy, you know, all the all the stuff you do when you want to make huge power. So um, this is a run I'm looking at here where it made 823 horsepower, had the blow up valve wide open, so not allowing the engine to see any boost here. And we can see that on average going through the run, we're anywhere, we're anywhere from a low of about 0.9 or so, 0.92, to a high of about 1.12 milliseconds for the combustion cycle. And degrees wise, we're seeing anywhere from about 37 to about 40 degrees of crank rotation to do that burn. So now look what happens on this one when we turn it up to like 76 pounds of boost. Now that combustion time starts out, we're in the 0.8s down to 0.80. Here we are in the 0 0.76, 0 0.75, 0 0.74. Considerably faster uh, time here in terms of actual milliseconds of time to do that. So in the case of the Sorceress, it did not follow that. As we started adding more boost, the mixture was burning faster and faster until we got to a point where it was actually burning so fast that we would get into pre-ignition and knock and stuff like that. And then we added some water injection and the water slowed the mixture burn time back down again. So we gave up some power to do that, but we prevented the engine from sort of destroying itself. So it's sort of like which one do you want? But in any case, what we found there was we did have to change the ignition timing for that particular combination. On other combinations like our LS and on my Godzilla, we didn't have to change the timing. Well, obviously there's a lot of data and a lot of things we can talk about, and it should be clear by now that one size definitely does not fit all. So my argument when Steve said, as long as your fuel is tolerant, you shouldn't have to add timing, I still don't know if I 100% agree with that because there's a lot of other variables than simply just what kind of fuel you have. 
But that means that Steve was both right and wrong, and can you be both of those? I guess so, in this case you can. So hey Steve, what do you think about all this?